On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, we talk with Jody wilson Pachisnik about strategic talk with your ex, third-party experts, and maximizing your own happiness. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Jody wilson Pachisnik. How are you? Hi, great to be back. Well, welcome back. And I think I could have butchered your name a second time. I have no idea if I did, but we're still sticking with it. I really want to thank you for coming back here with us today. And today we are going to talk about, you know, court. We're going to be talking about the things, you know, people don't know about when it comes to this whole entire process. We're going to talk about strategic talk with your ex and then also maximizing your own happiness. And for those that don't know who you are, who didn't listen to your previous recording with us or your previous episode, Jody Wilson Pachisnik is behind, you know, Jody Wilson Divorce Consulting. She has highconflictdivorceexpert.com. That's where you can find her. She's an expert in divorce. She's a coach. She's a strategist. And she uses a very unique blend of her expertise and her personal experience for her work. She's gone through this as well. You are a former attorney and you are a current post-baccalaureate in psychology. And today you're going to help a lot of people again. So let's start off with, you know, what are the things we don't know about, you know, going into court or everything about this kind of system, third-party experts, when it comes to high conflict uh, people? Yeah, that's a great question. And it reminds me of where I was 15 years ago when I didn't know anything about the world of family law either. As you said, I was a former practice attorney. I did not do family law back then. I did not know anything about family law until I went through my own divorce, which ended up being high conflict. And I had a huge custody battle that was very prolonged and expensive. And all of these terms started being thrown at me that I'd never heard before. My ex-spouse's attorney started saying, this is a high conflict case. And I thought, what does that mean? And I also thought, there's no reason for this to be high conflict, we could just be reasonable and do reasonable things and then it wouldn't be. But what I didn't realize is she was referring to a case that gets prolonged where there's uh, unreasonable positions being taken by one or both parties. So this was all a whole world that was opening up to me. I also didn't know that there are a huge number of family law professionals that work in the family law space. So you have people like guardians ad litem who represent the interests of the children. If the court appoints one, sometimes there's minors counsel. There are people who do um, uh, co-parent mediation, co-parent counseling. There are custody evaluators. There are uh, psychological evaluators. So there's this whole industry. And in fact, millions and millions and millions of dollars are tied up in this industry in the United States. There's a great documentary called Divorce Corp, as in corporation. Uh, You can find it online. I suggest everyone watch it. But it talks about all of the different professionals that are involved and how it's a multi, multi multi-million dollar industry. So one of the things I do in my coaching is I help people understand whether they would want any of these professionals in their case, or if one has been appointed, how do they deal with this professional? There are also, of course, experts that are willing to go and testify in court to help either party um, with their case, help educate the judge on various concepts. And there are all these different 
concepts that are really unique to family law and and buzzwords such as the concept of parental alienation that's a very controversial concept that's out there and there are experts who will talk about that so yeah it's this whole world uh, that opened up to me 15 years ago that i had never expected to know anything about when it comes to and i'm going to use quotes here my air quotes experts both sides bring in their own expert for the most part what's the point at that point like, oh, this person's an expert. I'm going to trust them. This person's an expert. I'm going to trust them. At that point, who cares? Like, each one of them is bringing them in. Now you're going to, what, try to say that this expert has no idea what they're talking about? Like, at what point do we get into society here in court where, like, these are just going to wash each other out? Like, why does it matter? And some judges feel that way as well. Exactly what you've said. There are judges that will not particularly care about expert testimony, and they'll just sort of throw it all out, not necessarily throw out the evidence, but throw out any persuasiveness that these experts have tried to put out there. There are other judges who rely heavily on experts because they feel like they don't know the psychological underpinnings of people's behavior. They don't know what psychology might drive this person to behave uh, in a good or bad way in the future. So they actually rely heavily on the experts. I think your question is one of those questions for the ages that we can't really answer. What is the point? Great question. What is the point? Um, But what litigants need to know is that the court judges oftentimes bring their own personal views and biases to the bench. They are supposed to be neutral and unbiased, but they're human beings. And you don't know if your judge uh, had a good childhood, a bad childhood. Did they love their mom and hate their dad? You know, love their dad, hate their mom. Did they grow up with their grandmother? Were their parents divorced or were their parents together? You just don't know what kind of biases they're bringing to the bench. And I think that the lawyers in the case hire experts hoping to appeal to whatever biases that uh, judge might have. What is also disheartening is that if one side hires an expert, usually the other side has to hire one. Otherwise, you don't have anything to contradict that expert. In my own case, I had no intention of hiring any experts and paying them tens of thousands of dollars to testify, but my opposing party hired one. So I had to go hire one. And that's sort of how it is in family law. You have to almost match what the other side is doing in terms of money expenditure, in terms of litigation strategy if you're going to prevail in your case. Not that you absolutely can't prevail without that, but it's certainly easier if you can match them. All that said, no amount of experts can cover up someone who is very, very obviously uh, severely mentally ill and abusive. I have seen cases where experts have come in to try to testify for very mentally ill, abusive people, and they just end up having egg on their face and looking silly because they're defending something that's not defensible. And when it comes to things like a guardian ad litem who's there for the child, we've heard horror stories when it comes to the guardian ad litem. They hold a lot of sway in in cases. So when it comes to having to deal with that, because I assume that parents are going to be interviewed, how do you go about that third party? Because that becomes a big issue because that person themselves can be swayed. They can be tricked. They can be manipulated. But we, we're, we're humans. We have emotions. 
someone who's really good can sway someone. So how do you go about this? It's best if my clients come to me before they have ever interacted with the expert, because it's a lot harder to rehabilitate someone's image if they've already sort of tarnished their image in the eyes of one of these experts. So if they come to me before they've even talked to the expert, I can explain to them what these experts are probably looking for, what these experts usually look for, and how to portray yourself in a way that's credible. We all know that narcissists can be very charming, very persuasive, and some of these experts will quickly fall under the spell, I would say, of a narcissist or other manipulative person. However, it's not the end of the world if that begins to happen and you can sort of turn the ship around because a lot of times narcissists will hang themselves with their own rope. You give them enough rope, they will hang themselves. I have seen more than one scenario where you have an expert on a case that's on a case for a long period of time. So an expert like a parenting coordinator or a guardian ad litem um, who initially finds the narcissist charming, but as the narcissist begins to show their true colors, the other parent can maintain this calm demeanor where they are seen as the more rational authority out of the two. So what I help people with is creating that demeanor, presenting themselves well, presenting themselves in a very consistent and calm way. It's important when we're talking about experts for litigants to understand how much weight the courts will place with their appointed experts. I'm not talking about the hired guns that come in at trial. I'm talking about someone like a guardian ad litem that the court appoints to say, I want this person to analyze what's going on in this family and tell me what I should do. Courts love to have somebody else tell them what to do. To be quite honest, they love having a guardian ad litem or a custody evaluator come and tell them what they should do with the case. And usually they will accept that recommendation. That's something that I think a lot of people don't know in this big world of family law. Judges don't actually like to make those hard decisions. So we talked about, you know, you brought the word strategy in there somewhere. So when it comes to, you know, dealing with your ex and strategy with them specifically going to court. You also mentioned, you know, let's give them the rope sometimes to let them hang themselves. So when you are having communications with your ex that aren't with the court, most likely through a parenting app or hopefully through one of those apps where like it's recorded, everything's kind of there. How would you go about strategy with talking with them to make your life a little bit easier, which is few and far between, but also what, what can you do to have them, you know, really showcase who they really are and let them freely write, you know, the abuse that that they're trying to hide from the court, but in this specific, you know, domain where, you know, it's recorded and like overseen by a, by a company. It's hard for them to argue, you know, what they've just written. So what are the strategies like when it comes to this? The first step in that strategy is to get them to use the app. So sometimes you'll have to get a court order for using the app, but you can't always get one. So how do you get one of these people to use the app? So I have a specific method that I use and I teach my clients to get their high conflict X to get on the app and use the app because, and, and I should get royalties from these apps, right? Because I'm always recommending them. Um, what is this? What is this way? How do you, how do you do it? Oh, I have an entire script. I would have to give you the script. It's a communication script that you, certain things you say to your ex, but basically you don't take no for an answer. 
you say, we're going to use this app. I think it's in the best interest of the children, blah, blah, blah. And then you stop communicating with them outside the app and just don't, don't go back on it. And narcissists want access to you usually. Now there are different kinds of narcissists. There's covert and overt and they have different personalities despite their narcissism, but usually they want access to their target uh, and their ex is usually their main target. So they will usually eventually get on the app. They'll resist it, but they'll eventually get on it if you make it clear to them that that's the only way you're going to communicate with them. So I, I've i written out all the steps of what to say to the person and you know what to do after each step. And I share that with my clients. Um, you want to be on the app for so many reasons. One is your peace of mind. You don't want a high conflict person in your phone constantly texting you every day because that's not good for your mental health. They are trying to trigger you. They are being abusive towards you in one way or the other through text messages. You don't want that in your phone all the time. You also probably don't want it in your email inbox unless you've created a special inbox just for that person. Because again, you don't want their toxicity polluting your day or your mind every day. Uh, the other reason you want to use the app, though, is you can't manipulate the app. So in email correspondence, for example, you could respond to someone and they could then respond to you and you have this whole email thread. There's nothing stopping either of you from going down into the email thread and changing what was said. And then printing that out and bringing it to the court as if it's real evidence. And it's kind of hard to prove to the court that it's not, that somebody went and changed one of the messages down in the thread, right? But you can't do that in the app. You can't manipulate it that way. The other thing that's great about uh, some of the apps, I prefer Our Family Wizard, although people use App Close, people use Talking Parents. There's a lot of decent apps out there. In our family wizard, you can add professionals. So your attorney can access it or your parenting coordinator, whoever you've added as a professional can look at the correspondence. But then going on to, you know, how do you make your life easier when you're communicating with this person? You use what we call yellow rock communication. So a lot of people have heard of gray rock communication. Yellow rock is when you have to go and do more back and forth with them than you normally would like to. So, you know, you're co-parenting with them. You have to communicate with them. But narcissists thrive on your emotion, whether it's positive or negative emotion. If they can't, if they can't have your love, they will take your hatred and that will feel good to them too. So you have to strip your correspondence of any of that. And I just worked with a wonderful woman, a client of mine that I absolutely love. For this last year, we've been working really hard on communication because her ex in every message accuses her of things, calls her names, calls her a narcissist, tells her how irresponsible she is, makes fun of her profession, you know, you name it. The guy is kind of a dirt bag. Um, and it triggers her. It's very hurtful to her. So we've worked for probably nine months straight this year on teaching her to respond back to him without giving him the satisfaction he's trying to get by doing that. He's playing the provo provoke and blame game, I call it. Provoke her. She gets provoked. He then blames her for her reaction. We're trying to get out of that cycle, right? She is now a communication wizard. She is so good at it. I am so proud of her. When I see her communication, I'm like, yes, you, you got it. You understand how to communicate with this guy to keep the focus on the kids. What do they need? What are we trying to accomplish? Ignore the garbage. Don't take the bait when he's insulting you. Just don't take the bait. Just look right past it. And the wonderful thing about this is it not only calms her mind and makes her feel so much better because she's got kind of a 
it's not quite a script, but a um, methodology she can use. She can just go to that methodology that I've taught and say, okay, this is how I'm supposed to respond. It, it strips away all that anxiety and questioning that she would otherwise have, where she would be like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to say. He did this thing. I don't know how to respond. So it calms her down. It makes her feel better, but it makes her look great in the eyes of the court. And in her last hearing that she had, the judge actually said he communicates in an abusive manner towards you. So you're sort of killing two birds with one stone in that you're making your life better and you're making yourself look great in front of the court as well. The other thing it does when she communicates properly with him is it actually triggers him. So many people have probably seen this at some point in their lives when you're dealing with someone who's out of control in their anger or in their emotions and you remain completely calm, they will often spin out and get escalated and they will act out even more. And this is usually true with most narcissists. If they're not getting the reaction that they want, they will up the ante and act out even more trying to get that narcissistic supply from you. And I'm talking about negative supply because, as I said, narcissists will take positive or negative, either one. It just makes them feel powerful. So that is one of the ways that you can get the narcissist to react in ways that make them look bad. You're using your knowledge of their personality disorder against them. This doesn't work with all narcissists. There are some very suave, covert narcissists who are very smart and have more control over their behavior who will catch on to this pretty quickly. You might be able to get them to react a few times and then they quickly kind of catch on to what you're doing and they stop reacting. Or their attorney gets involved and tells them to shut up and then they maybe start behaving better but it does work with most narcissists as i've seen um other important things to keep in mind in communicating is sometimes you have to take a step back and look at the whole back and forth in the communication and say is saying anything else going to add to this for me strategically or Do I have a good record right here? So, for example, if you have asked your former spouse to be cooperative about something and they've said no or they've said something rude and they're refusing to be cooperative, instead of asking them again and asking them again or asking them why they're not being cooperative, you might want to just leave the record as it is. Print that one out. Show the court that. Look, I asked for this very reasonable thing. She refused. She was, you know, putting her narcissism on display. It's right there. Obviously, you don't say narcissism to the court. That's another cardinal rule. But, um, you know, you're showing the court that they're not cooperating. Asking them why they're not cooperating and continuing in the back and forth just gives them an opportunity to manipulate the record to explain away their bad behavior. So knowing when to just stop is good. I think a lot of uh, victims of narcissistic abuse feel the need to keep going and explain themselves, justify themselves, ask again for cooperation, ask again, ask in a different way. And that oftentimes doesn't help them. So knowing when to say when and just like leave the record as it is, is important. So if you were to summarize, you know, the general communic the general communication with a narcissistic person, someone who's high conflict, what would you say? I think that the most important thing for litigants to keep in mind is that every single thing they write is for the court. It's not actually for the narcissist they're communicating with. Certainly they're trying to get something accomplished. Maybe they're trying to establish pick up or drop off times. But every single thing you write should be thought of as a piece of evidence that is going to go in front of the court. Along those lines, it's important to keep in mind that you don't have to convince 
the narcissist of anything in terms of convincing them of your point of view, convincing them that they've been bad in XYZ ways, delineating all the bad things they've done. You can save all that for the court. You're not going to convince them anyway. They're not going to agree with you that they've done all these terrible things. So you just keep it short and sweet, uh, to the point, child-oriented, and remember that it's for the court to read and for the court to think highly of, not for your former spouse to care about. And then save all your explaining and, uh, I guess, convincing for the court. Don't share that with your former spouse. It's not going to get you anywhere. So we've talked about you know, the trauma that you might be dealing with when it comes to dealing with you, you know, experts and talking with your ex and all these things. But within this, how do you help your clients maximize their happiness while dealing with all of this? The operative word when you're thinking of maximizing your happiness while co-parenting with a narcissist or going through a very prolonged divorce is detachment. You absolutely have to detach emotionally from what they're doing. What we say often is observe, don't absorb. So instead of absorbing all of their toxic behavior and feeling that you need to defend yourself, explain yourself, react to it. It's better to take a step back and sort of pretend like you're a scientist observing a biological phenomenon and just watch their behavior in this detached way. And we also say, respond, don't react. So instead of reacting with your immediate triggered feelings, Take a beat, wait a day, wait a couple days, and then respond in a measured, thoughtful way. Monitoring your own behavior can help you feel so much more in control of your case and of your life. If you're following this set of rules for how to interact with them, it just makes you feel so much more in control than when you're just letting yourself be triggered. And the more you do this distant observing from a detached place, the less they can get to you. Another part of this is compartmentalizing. I will say that when I first went into my very difficult divorce, I had no ability to compartmentalize. I let the toxicity that was going on seep into every part of my life and trigger me all day, every day. I was filled with anxiety. And I've learned over a decade's time to take that difficult, toxic stuff that's happening and put it on a shelf, put it in a box, put it on a shelf in my mind during the times of the day or the week that I can't actually do anything about it. Because it doesn't do you any good to stew about it or perseverate on it during times that you can't actually do anything about it. And yet that is a trauma response. Perseveration is a trauma response. People who've gone through trauma often spend a lot of time rolling around uh, the difficult thing in their head. And so you have to really work on controlling your mind and controlling your thoughts so that this doesn't take over your whole life. And meditation is one way of really learning how to control your own thoughts. The other part of this is to get out of the victim mindset. Even though you are a victim, you don't have to live in that space. You don't sort of have to unpack your bags and live there. You can say, this thing happened to me but I have hopes and dreams. I have things I want to do with my life. And I'm going to make decisions to move forward with my life, irrespective of what this high conflict narcissistic person is doing. Like I've seen some people in a high conflict divorce 
say, maybe I shouldn't go out and start a new business, or maybe I shouldn't go out and get a new job because that might reduce my child support, for example. I would say, no, go out and get the new job, go out and and start the new business. Because I often say to people that winning looks like freedom. People think when they're in a divorce situation that winning is vanquishing the other side or putting them in their place. But what winning really looks like is freedom, breaking free from this person, detaching from them emotionally, moving on with your life, uh, regardless of what they're doing, controlling the controllables and letting the rest go and putting all the difficulty and toxicity in a box on the shelf during the time that you can't deal with that. Um, There's a lot of grieving that happens too. And I think it's important to grieve the loss of what you didn't have or what you thought you were going to have that you didn't turn out to have, like the family, the marriage, uh, the entire future that you thought you were going to have with that person. Grieve that. Grieve the loss of the person you thought the narcissist was and you found out that they weren't. But then, again, don't unpack your bags and live there. Pick yourself up and move on with your life. And this is a lot of the coaching I do with my clients is coaching them on how to move forward where this difficult person isn't front and center in their brain all day, every day, because that's what freedom feels like. So before we leave today, do you have any words of wisdom on everything that we uh, talked about today? I'm trying to think of what I would say beyond what I have already said. But when we talked before, at the beginning of our first segment, I was talking about how I think of living a life with a narcissist in it, like living with a a debilitating disease. It's not something that you can't overcome. It is something that you manage, that you treat, uh, you follow your doctor's orders, and you can still live a life that is whole and full and happy. You can still live a life that's whole and full and happy, even with this very difficult person in your life. And the more work you do on your perspective on what's happening in your life, the happier you can be and the less power that person will have over you. So what I try to teach people is how to do that managing the same way a doctor would teach someone with a debilitative disease how to manage that disease. I'm teaching people how to manage the difficult person in their life so they can go ahead and thrive and be happy and live the life that they always wanted to live despite this thing that they don't have control over. Well, Jody wilson Pachisnik. I really want to thank you for being our guest again today and everyone out there. You can reach Jody at highconflictdivorceexpert.com. That will be in our show notes. And just a really big thank you for being our guest and sharing your knowledge once again. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you once again, Jody, for being here with us. And if you want to be a guest on our Survivor Story episodes, please go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. And there you can read all of our instructions. And either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. And we have a support group at NarcissistApocalypse.com. So if you need support, go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a support group button. When you click on that button, it takes you to our very own safe social network where you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday nights, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need from survivors just like you. You can make great friends on there as well. So if you need support, join our support group today. And if you need even more support, please visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. At DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you're dealing with. 
They have every phone number, email address, and web address for shelters and agencies, no matter how big or small the town you're in. DomesticShelters.org has it there. It is a wonderful free resource. So if you need extra support, go to DomesticShelters.org. And we have another friend of the show called Shelter Movers, and Shelter Movers can be found at sheltermovers.com, and Shelter Movers helps survivors of domestic violence transition to a better and safer life. It is a volunteer organization, a donor-supported organization, charitable organization as well. It is currently only in Canada, but they're looking to expand to the United States. And what they do is they help coordinate moves for people who are getting out of domestic violence and coercive control. They get all of your things out of your home, into storage, all of your belongings into storage, and and they can do this for your pets and livestock too. It is a wonderful organization. So if you need help from them or just want to donate to them, please go to sheltermovers.com. And that is it for today's episode. So for myself and Jody, we hope you have a good night.